Uh, we are really collecting during these days uh, lots of wisdom. So we had uh, several members of the Academy of Sciences from Hungary, from Norway, from Europe, and now we have one from Canada, uh, as uh, Dan Brooks is a uh, fellow at the Royal Society of Canada as well. So uh, those who uh, spent nearly a year with uh, him in Kőszeg, uh, should that be scholars, uh, researchers, uh, or, uh, or, 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 or staff, or students, they know that if you push a button, <laughs> then you hear, hear <laughs> about emerging diseases. Uh, then is evolutionary biologist, and uh, that is a typical sample how to make awareness of something. So I don't think there is anyone who is not aware of the emerging diseases who has been in Kurseg and then talked to them for more than an hour. So, but uh, uh, we are a community who would like to uh, have people to go out of their comfort zone, so therefore we pick the topics for Dan, which is not his favorite topic. So I hand over uh, the word for you regarding the topics migration. This one? Not that one? This one's better? Okay. Uh, thank you very much for that wonderful introduction. And um, I would like to um, express my, my great appreciation to everybody at IASC for uh, both the intellectual environment and the personal environment that I've experienced in the time that I've been there. Um, uh, as it turns out, you're not going to be completely spared from references to emerging diseases. Um, but this is partly because it's impossible to talk about any one element of climate change without discussing at least two or three others, you know, what we call threat multipliers. Um, everything's connected, blah, 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 blah. So what I'm going to talk about today is, is about the evolutionary biology of migration. I'm not going to say anything about what anybody ought to be doing about any particular issue with migration today. What I'm going to do is to explain why we have a migration issue, why there's a, a human migration problem, and I'm going to suggest some elements of that that you might not have thought about um, before, some of which have to do with <coughs> disease. All right, whoops, sorry. Uh, this, by the way, is, this is my, my slide for the difference between climate and climate change. This particular photograph, uh, and it also, has something to do with migration because it's from Mongolia uh, and, and it's, it's a shot of, of a gear of some, some migrating sheep herders. But the storm in the background is what's called a derecho storm. It's like a tornado that's been stretched out without swirling up. Now, when it occurs, something like this occurs in Mongolia, it's weather, it's climate. But when something like this occurs in Kursig, as happened about four months ago, that's climate change. Okay, an inconvenient truth. Climate change unites humanity like it has never been united before. We've heard nothing about a unified humanity for the last day and a half. So this is, this is not exactly what you were expecting to hear. And there are two reasons for that. The first is, that climate change is a national security issue for every country. And if it's a national security issue for every country, it's a global security issue, whether we like it or not. And it's a national security issue in just about every aspect that a country might be concerned with its security. As well, climate change unites humanity because it is literally beyond belief. 
no matter what religion you believe in, no matter what political system you believe in, no matter what economic system you believe in, you are being treated exactly the same by climate change. Mother Nature does not care what you believe. So this, whether we like it or not, this puts us all in exactly the same boat. We can't stop climate change. We cannot reverse climate change. Right now, it's becoming more apparent that we probably can't even slow it down, and it's accelerating. Now, the reason I have the first two things in white instead of yellow is because it wasn't until the last year of President Obama's administration that any American president stopped talking about reversing climate change and started talking about coping with or adapting to climate change. So that was a welcome thing. Unfortunately, it only lasted for a year, and then we went back to, not, not to, we're going to reverse climate change, we're just going to pretend it doesn't exist. Now, there are some good things happening in the world of climate change. These are some of them. Global fertility rates are declining faster than anticipated. This was really good news about two weeks ago. Fewer than 50% of the countries on this planet now are producing enough babies to maintain their populations. Now, if you have an economic model based on producing an enormous number of poorly skilled and poorly paid laborers, this is bad news. If you're a climate change specialist, this is the best thing you've heard in 20 years. Use of alternative fuels, alternative energy is increasing, this is good stuff. Generally, health is improving over the world. In, in particular, infant mortalities are dropping around the world. And fresh water is abundant. It's going to be distributed in different ways, and that creates a problem. But there's a lot of fresh water, which turns out to be a good thing because there's no alternative fresh water for human beings. Unfortunately, there are also a number of reasons for us to be not particularly happy about the state of the world, and here are some of them. And at the bottom is something that I'm going to talk about today, conflict and migration. The, the first four items in white here are sort of the traditional views of sustainability. So over the last 30 years, Meetings that I've attended, things, papers that I've read, uh, read and, and so on about sustainability have fallen into these four categories. We want a guaranteed future with no cost. That's what the politicians want. We want it simple and easy to understand. That's what the journalists tend to want. Uh, we want it to, to be the way we think it used to be. That's what the environmentalists want. And they're wrong because what they, what they believe, what they want to believe things were like in the past is not the way things really were. And then finally, there are the, we want it the way we want it. You tell me what you want the world to be, I will engineer it. So those are sort of four different categories of sustainability studies. What I'm suggesting now is that the, the most recent information we have about what is happening to the planet is that we have to reframe that we don't have the luxury of worrying about quality of anything at this point. Our fundamental interest has to be in survival. So any questions about sustainability going forward have to start from the standpoint of not what we want, but what we need. And the first thing we need is to survive. And this, this connects with what, uh, what Yuri Cepoli was saying earlier today. And uh, I just put that little thing in about the four laws of biotics, which we can talk about later if anybody's interested. We don't have a lot of time. We don't have a lot of time. It turns out that limits to growth, which has been incredibly criticized and misrepresented for being the apocalyptic, you know, everything's going to go, go to hell thing. It turns out that limits to growth was the most optimistic analysis that's still floating around. Even the IPCC has finally realized that the year 2100 is not a realistic point for us to start worrying. 
So at the moment, the consensus seems to be that 2050 is what we would call the LD50, or the lethal dose 50, uh, for humanity. Uh, LD50 is a term from toxicology reports. That's the, the toxicology studies. That's the, the dose in the laboratory at, at which your toxin will kill 50% of the lab rats. Um, the, the other thing that's kind of important about this is not only do we think we don't have a lot of time to do stuff, but there are very clear indications that biosphere is already starting to cope with climate change evolutionarily, and it's not waiting for us, as every evolutionary biology would anticipate. The biosphere is just taking care of itself. Science has a critical role to play because finding things out is better than making shit up. Okay, so for example, humanity knew in 1896 when Arrhenius published his, his study that industrial output was going to warm the atmosphere. In 1896, Arrhenius said, at current production rates, industrial outputs will put enough carbon dioxide into the atmosphere to raise global temperatures, atmospheric temperatures, three degrees Celsius by 2100. The problem was that he was, he was also a great humanitarian and he said, but this will be a good thing because it will lengthen the growing season and we'll be able to produce more food to feed all of those workers that we need to power the factories. Well, no, but nobody's perfect, right? 1958, Charles Elton, a famous British ecologist, said, humanity has never faced climate change of the magnitude that is happening now and is coming at us. And he predicted that the two major outcomes, the two major threats of climate change going forward were going to be conflict and migration. When he published this book, Dwight Eisenhower was the president of the United States. We now have Donald Trump, and in between, a whole range of presidents of varying political types, different parties, none of them paid any attention to this. And of course, the United States wasn't alone. Nobody paid any attention to this. Okay. The black elephant, this is a combination of the elephant in the room and the black swan. Okay, this is, this is something we didn't anticipate, but once it happened, we ignored it. Okay, and that is that biology is really central to this. It's not a matter of, let's do some physics, and then let's immediately jump to social systems. Because the reality is that climate change is created by life. If there was no life on this planet, nobody would care, nobody would be studying you know, no exobiologist would be from some other planet would be studying this place. And all the life on this planet is evolved life. So the story of climate change has to involve life, and if it involves life, it has to involve evolution. That's not, I'm not saying that evolution is going to explain everything. But any explanation of what's going on that does not ev involve the evolutionary history and evolutionary capabilities of life on this planet will necessarily be incomplete. In these following ways, the first thing we have to understand is that evolution is brutally short-sighted and relentless. Evolution shows us that there are severe limits to growth with great penalties for overshooting that growth that may be postponed, for example, by the development of technology, but never completely avoided. The bills will come due eventually. Evolution says that if you persist long enough, if you survive long enough, you may come up with a better way of doing things. But even if you do, the next time climate changes, that's going to be obsolete. So there's no optimal solution for anything in, in evolution. Evolutionary changes are the result of conflict resolution, not conflict and replacement. And conflict resolution requires cooperation. And finally, in evolution, 
the only sense of progress is survival. At, at one point at the University of Toronto, uh, nobody was getting a pay raise for many, many years. And we used to joke that, that your pay raise at Toronto was, you still have your job, don't you? Well, that's, a sense of, that's the only sense of progress in evolution. You're still alive, aren't you? You're still here. That's good. All right, so what is at risk? It's not the biosphere. The biosphere is not at risk. And this is a real problem for uh, the funding campaigns for a lot of environmental organizations because it's, they're all based on the notion that the biosphere is extremely fragile and we've just about broken it completely and if you don't send them a bunch of money, things are going to, to just disintegrate. Well, the fact of the matter is, the biosphere has been hit with far greater insults than anything we're doing to it now. And it's always been capable of regenerating itself. Lao Tzu said that new beginnings are often disguised as painful endings. And it turns out that every mass extinction event on this planet, which was due to some major environmental perturbation, has been an evolutionary reset. So here's something that, you know, if you've ever taken a first year biology class, you've seen this. So through time, we have situations in which evolutionary diversification occurs. There's a massive environmental insult that causes a lot of extinction. Re-evolution, massive insult, extinction, re-evolution. And it turns out that the, the rate of re-diversification is actually inversely proportional, I'm sorry, is directly proportional to the magnitude of the insult. So the worse you treat the biosphere, the faster it'll, it will evolve in response. You can't kill it. You can, unless you blow up the planet, you cannot kill the biosphere. This is good news for the biosphere. Now, here, in a nutshell, is everything you need to know about the dynamics of evolutionary diversification. If the conditions change, you run away. Alicia Stegall, who's this brilliant paleontologist at Ohio University, has, has amassed an enormous amount of information about this. It turns out that if you go back 500 million years, 300 million years, to these major mass extinction events, the species lineages that survive are the things that run away. They're not the things that stay there and heroically cope with what's coming at them. They run away and survive to fight another day. If you can't flee, you try to cope, but mostly that doesn't work. And if you can't cope, you die. And that's what all the extinctions are about. So, the title of my talk, that, that Room to Move, comes from this line, this, this uh, refrain in, a, in a, a song by John Mayo. You gotta free me because I can't give the best unless I got room to move. In other words, if you can't run away, you're not going to survive major climate change. That's evolutionary history. Okay, now remember, in evolution, history is important, but history is not destiny. So this is what I'm telling you now is what has been the case up to this point. Here, for example, are a couple of migrants into Hungary. These are a couple of species that are running away from parts of the world where it's getting too hot for them. One is a golden jackal and the other is the Spanish slug, which my poor wife spent an enormous amount of time trying to kill in her garden in, in good this past summer. So let's look at what human beings have done and we'll just do recent human history, so the last 150,000 years or so. Now, from 150,000 years to about 90,000 years ago, human beings experienced, lived in a period of relative climate stability. So that's this. During that time of stability, we spread out. We moved into new habitats, and we started doing new things. Among other things, 
we changed our diet. We started eating a lot of meat. And we started making tools that allowed us to stop being scavengers and actually start killing our own meat. Um, and unfortunately, we also realized that the same thing that we could use to kill a leopard, we could use to kill some other human that we didn't like, but that's a different story. Now, one of the things that happened with this change in diet was that human beings started to get big. We started to get bigger. And disproportionately, women started to get bigger faster than men. So in terms of body size evolution, women benefited more than men from adding meat to the diet. But this is a problem, as it turns out. That was the beginning of a problem that nobody would have realized because at that time, human population density was really low. The bigger, stronger, better fed a woman is, the bigger and stronger and more healthy her babies are. She's not going to start having you know, babies every five months or something, but she's going to have higher quality babies. The babies are going to survive more often. Uh, we also acquired a bunch of interesting new diseases as a result of eating new things. So we have some tapeworms, for example, whose closest relatives live in lions and leopards and, and wolves and things like that. Okay, now, from about 90,000 years ago until 12,000 years ago, human beings lived through a period of not unusually great climate instability, but actually more typical climate instability of the record for the last three or 400 million years ago. So that's what this is all about. Up and down, up and down, hot, cold, hot, cold, hot, cold. Cold, 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 hot, hot, hot. And during that time, we expanded geographically again. So when it got hot, we moved out. Then when it got cold, we got isolated. Got hot, we moved again. Got cold, it got isolated. Every chance we had to move, we moved. Every time we moved, we added something to our dietary repertoire. We got bigger. Our women got disproportionately even bigger. Bigger, healthier women, more people, more potential for human conflict because the this, this groups were getting larger faster because more babies were surviving. And the hunter-gatherer groups had a, a particular size. And if you got larger than that, it just wasn't working very well, so the groups would split and fragment and move off. And of course, as we added new food items and, and moved into different parts of the world, we added even more diseases. Okay, and starting about 12,000 years ago, right here, what we call the Holocene, human beings experienced an almost unparalleled period of climate stability. I don't mean, it's not, it wasn't static but it was unbelievably stable. It may have been the most stable 12,000 year period in the history of this planet, or the history of the planet with life on it. But all we know is that during the Holocene, not a whole lot was happening. We were not being hit with, with the kinds, the magnitudes of, of climate change events. And that's what Elton was talking about in 1958 when he said, Humanity has never seen the magnitude. Modern humans have never seen the magnitude of climate change that's coming at us. And during that time, some really important things happened. That's when we developed domestication. That's when we developed agriculture. And domestication and agriculture required that you settle down. We stopped moving around. We started staying in one place. Now, as it turns out, there were a lot of benefits to that lifestyle. And during a period of climate stability, we could get away with it. We could believe that there were no costs to the benefits, that this was a life of nothing but benefits. Oh, and of course, we and our got bigger and healthier and had more people, but we became less mobile. 
So the p size of the social groups became larger and larger. Uh, and we picked up more diseases, and, but at the time, nobody knew about diseases, so nobody could have associated, they didn't know what, why people were getting sick, so they couldn't associate that with lots of people crowded together in one place. So by about 9,500 years ago, human beings were building fairly permanent kinds of, of, of living spaces, even if they weren't staying there all the time, okay? But they were at least not moving around freely. They would, would either be in one place forever, or they would always come back to the same place. And this is really important. And between 7,000 years ago and 150 years ago, that was, again, more climate stability. And that's when we stopped being just sedentary agro-pastoralists. That's when we started creating real cities. And a, a city, a, a, it, basically what I'm talking about are, are living settlements where f a proportionately fewer and fewer people were involved in producing food. So you now had people who were doing other things. And there are all these benefits of specialization and da-da-da, and, and we know about all those benefits. The problem is that there were some, some warning signs that we didn't know about because there wasn't any such thing as science at that point. We stopped moving around. We stopped moving around a lot in a sense. One of the things that meant is if we weren't moving around, that meant if we wanted more than we were producing locally, we had to trade for it. So now trade is not something, you know, some sort of special thing that happens when you happen to run into another nomadic group of people. Trade now becomes essential. And that turn, it turns out that we had been trading for a, a very long time. There's now evidence of trans-Eurasian trading routes from the Paleolithic, way earlier than that. So human beings had already been trading, but at this point, it was not a luxury. It was a necessity. And we were getting bigger and healthier, and we were getting more, less mobile. We were having more kids, populations were getting bigger, the cities were becoming places where lots of really good things were stored. And by about 9,000 years ago, we have the first archaeological evidence of organized warfare against settlements. Because it's easier to come and take somebody else's stuff than to make it yourself. All right. Now, during this time, this is from 7,000 years ago until 150 years ago. 250 years ago. There were short but intense climate change events. Okay, when I say it was relatively stable, it doesn't mean it was flatline. There were fluctuations, of course. And, and I have heard people say, oh, yes, well, don't worry about climate change because human beings have been exposed to climate change before and we did just fine. Turns out, that's a lie. Every human civilization that has been hit with a major climate change event in the last 7,000 years was destroyed forever and never returned. And this is, unfortunately, the, the lights are up, but this is a photograph of Angkor Wat at dawn. Angkor Wat was a wonderful civilization destroyed by climate change. Fluctuating flood, drought, flood, drought cycles broke the water system and after about 30 years of trying to cope with it, the people who lived there just said, the hell with it, we're moving. And they moved about 200 kilometers away, but they never built another city like this. Same thing happened to the Mayans. The same thing happened to the Tamils in Sri Lanka. And sometime later in the 13th century, for example, that's why the Mongols left Hungary. The Mongols had a wonderful horse rider communication system, like a Pony Express system. You could be infected with plague and not show any symptoms, 
incubate the plague, incubate uh, uh, Yersinia for a week, which is all the time it took you to get to the capital city, Ulaanbaatar. And then you get sick. Then everybody gets sick. Then the next thing you know, all of the generals get messages from the capital city saying, a pestilence has broken out, the Khan is dead, return home. And that was the last time there was a Mongol Empire. Okay, I told you I, I would work the disease in there. All right, nobody's fault, but everybody's to blame. Okay, this is a theme in, in our book that we've got coming out. So this sort of really brief history of human evolution and movement is intended to show that human beings always made decisions coping with immediate problems of the day in the way that seemed appropriate at the time. This is very evolutionary. That's why I said evolutionary, evolution is brutally short-sighted, but relentless, because we kept doing this. And as long as we weren't dead, we kept you know, solving one problem after another on a contingency basis. And in fact, until 1859, we had no scientific framework for even beginning to think about unanticipated consequences of actions. So we had no way of knowing. But what this means is that it's actually technological humanity, it's actually urbanized humanity that is most at risk. And, and this is really tough to believe because aren't we the pinnacle of thousands of years of human evolution? Don't we have the internet? Don't we have all this good stuff? Aren't we protected? Well, it turns out that in the infrastructure that we created to protect us from, from the environment has actually put it at, at risk, put us at risk. That's because we changed our evolutionary legacy. We are no longer a species that runs away from problems. We're a species that stays in place and tries to cope with the problem. And we have been living beyond our means in this technological niche that we've constructed, and the bill is now due. Here are some problems with living in a modern city. Modern cities are density traps, and they are connectivity traps. They are places where human beings are crowded together, and they are places that only exist because of hyperconnectivity with other places. And as a result, they are extremely susceptible to a number of things, uh, one of which is, oh, disease. Okay. In 1950, 30% of human beings lived in cities. By 2050, the, this is a very conservative estimate. It's probably going to be higher than that. Um, but at least 70% of the world will live in cities. Now, between 1950 and 2050, what we have done is, in the last two generations, we have produced two generations of kids who are almost entirely urbanized children. And that, that turns out to be important going forward. So, now I'm going to talk about some migration issues in the context of what human beings have done to themselves. In other words, why do we have a migration problem? The first migration problem we have is high density of human beings. A hundred years ago, this month, the Spanish influenza pandemic killed 10% of humanity. And at that time, less than 15% of human beings lived in cities. We now live in a situation in which the human population density in influenza is a disease that is spread in proportion. It's a person-to-person -person contact thing. It's spread in proportion to population density. Human beings now, not only are there four and a half times more human beings than in 1918, but in addition, we have four and a half times the population density. Okay? So we're looking at, this is why Bill Gates is worried about the next influenza pandemic. And the other problem is we've never been able to reconstruct the genotype of the particular strain that caused that pandemic. I mean, we've been working, we've even dug up corpses from the permafrost in Alaska to try to isolate it and haven't been able to. So we don't know where it is, what it is, when it's going to show up again. 
So that's one problem. And this is a problem for a city like Budapest, for example, because of migration from the countryside into the city by Hungarians. This is a Hungarian migration problem. Here's another migration problem that I showed you before, okay? These are migrants coming into Hungary. The golden jackal from, this, from the Mediterranean, the Spanish slug from, oh, Spain. These guys carry, among other things, carry echinococcus, which can cause severe fatal brain infections in human beings. These guys, some of you may have seen, some of you younger ones in particular, may have seen the story a, a, a week or so, or ago or so about the guy who ate a raw slug on a dare and he got infected with rat lungworm and died. Intermediate host for rat lungworm, okay? And these are migrants, okay? So in a sense, other kinds of migration problems we're talking about turn out to be really small. This is, you know, and this is just evolution. This is just what has always happened. This is what people do, it's what animals do, it's what plants do. So we really do need to think outside the box. Climate change is accelerating. We're probably past some tipping points already. We're into this second order world. We can't afford business as usual and inaction is not an option. You know, as, as Tomas was saying yesterday, if you don't know where to go, at least go in one direction because standing still in one place is, is not going to be a reasonable choice. We can't return to the past. So forget all of this back to the future crap. Besides, Every woman in this audience knows that the 13th century was not a great time for women. If we return to the hunter-gatherer behavior, all of our children, my children, and grandchildren are going to die because they can't live outside of a city. So, we have to cope with this. I mean, this is what we have to try to save, and it's what is most at risk. Cooperation is a good thing. Okay? As Charles Darwin said, even though there is this perception that evolutionary biologists only believe in conflict and don't believe in, co in cooperation, it's a bunch of crap. The most fundamental form of psychological denial is hope. Hope is completely irrational. Hope is denial in the face of reality. I hope that guy who's pointing a rifle at me doesn't shoot me. So let's think of climate change threats as the things that came out of Pandora's box. Well, the whole story of Pandora's box was at the bottom, crushed at the bottom of Pandora's box, it was almost missed, was, this, was hope. Let hope out. And the real story about Pandora's box is that you can't cope with all the evils of the world if you don't have hope. Okay, but hope is not a plan. Hope is only a reason to have a plan. So what do we think about with respect to actually doing something? And this is the metaphor that we call anticipate to mitigate. Crisis response is too expensive. If we don't anticipate what's coming at us and try to mitigate its impacts, we're not going to be able to afford to, to, to survive. So we have to buy time. Now it turns out that we've done a lot of good things in the past 50 years that have bought us time and we have mostly pissed that away pretending that we were conquering climate change. Recycling, better fuel mileage, reusable parts, longer lasting this, green technology, recycling, alternative fuels, all these things are really, really good. They bought us time. They probably bought us 50 years of time. And we've wasted 45 of those 50 years of extra time that we bought. And we have to stop being stupid about this. Like my real president once said, 
don't do stupid shit. That's not what was reported. It was reported as don't do stupid stuff. We have to buy time, and our policies have to be based on the idea that we need to survive, and in order to survive, we have to buy time to figure things out because things are going too fast right now. What we have right now to throw at climate change can only buy us time. It's not going to solve the problem. And this is, you recognize this from the, some of you will recognize this from, from the Vietnam era. Pogo is a, a famous cartoon strip. It was completely non-political until finally the, 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 the artist had had enough. And he wrote this anti-Vietnam thing that ended with, we have met the enemy and he is us. Okay, so, we're an urbanized species. There are all these problems. It's made us vulnerable. Is there anything we can do about this? Well, it turns out, actually, we can. Because with our technology, especially our internet technology, it's potentially possible to link together a group of cooperating small cities, each of which is sustained by a circular economy, to emulate the benefits of a big city while mitigating the problems, the vulnerabilities associated with a big city, like population density and disease, for example. And you've seen this slide before. Uh, Tomas produced it. And we actually have such a proposal in Kursik. Um, and, and I would point out also that the circular economy, of course, is, is a biological theory. Circular economy is based on analogy with animal metabolism. That's the whole basis of it. The more times you can use the energy in, in your food, the more efficient you're going to be, which means I'm really efficient, unfortunately. So we need a sense of urgency, but not panic. Okay? We need to do something. People who are panicked can't do anything except vibrate in place and be panicked. But people who don't think there's a problem won't do anything either. So be afraid, be very afraid, but don't panic because we have a plan. And it turns out that scientists working in all areas of climate change actually have been following a consistent kind of protocol. It's, it's sort of emerged and everybody is doing this in one way or another. It's what we call the DAMA protocol. Document what's going on, assess the significance, monitor things, reassess, monitor, and when you figure out what we ought to do, then act on that. The problem is that this is the actual protocol. At least this is what the scientific community thinks the actual protocol is. It's what we call the DAM protocol document, assess, monitor, and do nothing. And you just accumulate white papers and conference volumes about the growing problem. And nothing gets done. There's a lot of rhetoric. So one of the stories that I use because, uh, I mean, I don't, want to, I don't want to own Donald Trump, but the reality is in a representative democracy, unfortunately, you do have to wear whoever gets elected for, for four years anyway. And one of my responses when people say, oh, you Americans, you know, you don't believe in climate change, blah, 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 I said, look, the president of France says that France believes in climate change. But if that were true, Paris would not have flooded last spring. Talk is cheap. The time is short, the danger is great, and we are largely unprepared. That was the message that came from a conference in Singapore two years ago where Sean and, and I, among others, spoke. But we can change that if we decide to do something. And the strange thing is the scientific community actually has some really good ideas about what to do. So it's like you have a Ferrari in your garage, but you don't have any money for gasoline. That's a very frustrating situation to be in. You'd like to be driving that Ferrari. And there are significant limits on science. The most significant limit on science is that there is no place on this planet where scientists can make something happen. There's no place on this planet where a scientist can walk, 
into a press conference and say, we need to start doing this now, and the government says, how much money do you need for the program? Right? So, action, action requires cooperation from the rest of society. And scientists need to understand that. That's why we've been having discussions about the need for scientists to communicate their ideas and their concerns effectively. It's because they need to talk to the people who can actually make something happen. It's not like a scientist is going to convince a policy person to write a check for the scientist to go and do something. That's not the way it works. I wouldn't know how to do that by myself anyway, no matter how much money somebody gave me. So this is what we used to call in biodiversity studies, we used to call this the Jane Austen principle, that we have to replace pride and prejudice with sense and sen sensibility. And the reason that I bring that up is because the single greatest impediment we have to survival is that we will not survive if we do not cooperate with people we don't like. See, human beings cooperate really well with people they like. This is a group of students from Ohio who took a semester off from university to go to New Orleans to help with reconstruction after Hurricane Katrina. Now, they're not, they didn't know any of the people there, but they were other Americans, they were people they felt empathy for, they were members of the same country, and so on. Human beings are capable of great amounts of cooperation, but it has to be with somebody we feel warm and fuzzy about. And overcoming that piece of our, our evolution, because for many, many years, it was not necessarily a good thing to automatically feel warm and fuzzy about the next stranger that came around the bend in the forest. But we cannot c defeat a common foe if we're at war with ourselves. And very shortly, if it's not already true, there are only going to be two kinds of places on this planet. Places that people are running away from and places that people are running to. And we have to understand that. We have to acknowledge that this is the new reality. Now, Eldridge Cleaver said in 50 years ago, and he was speaking about race relations in the United States, that there is no more neutrality in the world. You're either going to be part of the solution or you're going to be part of the problem. Uh, or as my chemist friends say, you're either going to be part of the solution or part of the precipitate. T.S. Eliot, at the end of the First World War, was not feeling very positive about the future of the world. Not, and he wrote this poem called The Hollow Man, which ends with this really very downbeat sentiment that humanity was just going to very quietly kill itself off and disappear. We were going out with a whimper and not a bang. And so I leave you with a bust of Cassandra. Thank you, Dan. And that's the first, the minimum you deserve. <laughs> and uh, yeah, uh, I think uh, uh, we covered uh, the history of the biosphere, so coming uh, from quite uh, uh, far away. And uh, we were seeing migrating animals uh, and um, actually you were touching up on solutions. So my question is that uh, we had also Klaus Hofer asking uh, what to do. So what are the three things to do? One was cooperation. Right. Well, I mean, th this is what we call... The, what, this is what, we, what we've categorized as anticipate to mitigate. I mean, basically, most of the things that we're doing with respect to climate change is reacting to events. 
and this is especially true in the, in the health areas. I mean, the public health, agricultural health practices have been extremely conservative. And one of the reasons for that is because, for example, in, in public health, in Western culture, every physician is taught that the fundamental ethical basis of medical practice is do no harm. But this is not some sort of humanitarian statement. This is a legal defense mechanism that stems from the Code of Hammurabi, where if somebody comes to you with, with an infected eye and you treat them and the eye is lost anyway, your eye is taken out. Or if they come to you with an infected tooth and they lose the tooth anyway as a result of your treatment, they take your tooth out. And that's where we get the expression, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. And that makes medical practice and veterinary medical practice extraordinarily conservative. In other words, don't do anything until there's clearly a problem. And that's fine as long as nothing is changing. If you know all the diseases you're going to see and you know how to treat all of them, you just wait till the symptoms show up and you treat. But what happens, what would happen, I mean, how many family practitioners in Hungary would recognize a 12-year-old child with malaria? About the same percentage as American family practitioners. And yet, you're going to have to, under, you're going to, have to know this. Within a very short time, there's going to be malaria in Hungary. Now, is there any way we can slow this down? Is there any way we can mitigate the impact of malaria in Hungary? Well, it turns out there, is, there are actually some deceptively simple, cheap things we can do, but they involve a lot of what we call sweat equity. That is, a lot of people have to spend a lot of time teaching local people things and doing things that involve walking around and working with people who are not specialists. So, in the case of malaria, first thing we need to know is who spreads malaria? Mosquitoes. All mosquitoes? No, not all of them. Just the ones that feed on human beings. All the ones that feed on human beings? No. The ones that feed twice. Because if you're a mosquito who only feeds once on a human being, you're not going to transmit a disease. You can only transmit a disease if you feed once on an infected person and then feed again on an uninfected person. Okay? Now, of the mosquitoes that feed twice, is it all of those mosquitoes? No, it turns out it's just the females. Okay. So this is some practical, practical natural history. All right. What do the male mosquitoes do? Okay, all of our efforts at, at, at malaria control in the past have been based on trying to kill the female mosquitoes or spending an enormous amount of money to develop a malaria vaccine so we can vaccinate uh, troops in case they need to go into a malaria zone. What do the male mosquitoes do? What do they eat? Well, it turns out that they feed on plants. They suck plant juices. Instead of sucking blood, they, sunk, they, they, they suck plant juices. Any plants? No, it turns out they have preferences. And the strange thing about it is that in the United States, for example, the tiger mosquito, which has been introduced to the United States and is a carrier of dengue, which is now it finally admitted to be in the United States, the tiger mosquito has preferences. The males have preferences for certain plants. And it turns out that among those plants are extremely common garden flowers. So if you have a bird bath in your garden and you are planting those plants, you have created a mosquito factory. The males are there, the females will come in to mate with them, then deposit their eggs in the bird bath and go off. So what can you do? Don't plant those flowers. Plant some other flower. Do what I did when I was a kid. One of my jobs during the summer was to look at the bird bath in the garden. If there are mosquito larvae in it, hose it out 
and replace it with clean water and make sure the mosquito larvae are gone. Nobody does that anymore because we think we're protected, we think we're safe, we think it will never happen to us. Okay, so... <laughs> so those are, those are the kinds of things we can do, but you need to... But that's going to require people going into local neighborhoods. Uh, okay, uh, Jim arrived and uh, showed already. Okay. Yeah, I think you need. Well, Dan, you and I have had a lot of conversations about all of this, and one of the things that strikes me is that underneath your presentation is a real moral charge to people. In other words, you know, you've got to get busy, everybody, and do things, right? I wonder if that's correct. And I wonder about it because I think people may be resistant to moral claims for various reasons. Um, James Lovelock, whose work I'm sure you know, uh, thought that the Earth was a living organism. That's he coined the, the term Gaia for this, right? Lovelock argued that at the end of this century, there'd only be a billion people left on the planet. And he thought that would be a good thing. Now, how many people do you want on the planet? Uh, because I would argue, not happily, I must say, you know, they've just issued a report that about 80,000 children have died of starvation in Yemen because of the war that the Saudis are prosecuting there. You know, is that a bad thing? 80,000 less kids to consume all the stuff that we produce? Well, it's horrifying in the way that it has been done. But population is the big issue here. We can't create more consumers on this planet. Or you get things like the whale that washed up in Indonesia last couple of weeks ago that had 115 plastic cups in its gut, along with flip-flops, and many other things, about a thousand pieces of plastic. What do you do? Is the plan that you articulate take, going to take account of the population pressures in such a way that we, or, or are we deceiving ourselves with a new kind of moral claim on people? Do we really want to be, I'm not sure I could do it, be as hard, to be, say, well, let them die. What do we do? Because I don't think people are going to respond to the claims that you and I would tend to emphasize. Okay, uh, and any other? Thanks very much for the talk, Dan. I want to ask a question from a slightly different perspective and just interested in how you would approach this. It strikes me that one of the crucial things, and maybe this touches on the moral issue in a different way, um, but not primarily, is how people even understand the environment, including the biosphere in which they are embedded and are part of fundamentally, in this kind of integrated and mutually dependent way that you describe. And I mean, not just whether it's in, in urban centers and high population density, but in the sense that these are, the vectors of disease are also mobile, <laughs> clearly, and mobile because of climate change, but also mobile for many other reasons, including the globalization itself. We carry it around, we get off the plane, etc. We don't have to ride horseback across the steps. Um, but it's the same idea. But I think that, that one of the challenges we have, plan or not, is even engaging with people in such a way that there is a greater understanding and appreciation of the consequences of that. That goes back to what I talked about earlier with the compl complexity and how people begin to understand systemic, cascaded, multiple-pronged uh, risk. 
And I think you've articulated that. The question is how do we then use that in terms of policy and actions? I'll be a little bit more skeptical about the human-based approach because uh, it will take years, decades, and generations to make a mass scale shift of mentality and get people to do things that they would do now. Uh, so what would you encourage uh, to have uh, on the plate of the industry? This is what's missing for many of the government programs, uh, United Nations, and so on. What incentives could uh, really keep them uh, focused on these climate change uh, goals and uh, still uh, allow them to have the certain level of uh, profit uh, and then go for this bio-based uh, circular economy and whatever? Thank you. Let me, let me start with the last question because that's, I mean, it kind of then leads into the others. Um, my perspective is that the environmentalist movement made an enormous strategic mistake and moral mistake right from the beginning by deciding that they would have a better fundraising opportunity if they demonized industry rather than cooperating with it. If, in fact, the environmentalist movement had gone to uh, say, Duke Energy Company in North Carolina 40 years ago and said, how can we work with you to guarantee your profits, which is all you want because corporations are psychopathic, in a way that moves towards renewable, non-polluting energy. So if we guarantee that you can make your money Will you move away from this stuff that you know is a limited resource and you know is non-renewable and you know is polluting? And we didn't do that. So what is the situation in North Carolina today? Who is the largest investor in solar power in North Carolina? Duke Energy. Duke Energy will come out and install solar panels on your house for free if you allow them to drain off any overproduction that your house generates. So that's, it's happening. I mean, that's exactly, you know, we should have done it 30 or 40 years ago. We didn't, we screwed up, but it's happening anyway. And now the question is, this is, this is an inflection point. This is a point at which the environmentalist movement needs to pivot very rapidly and cooperate. Um, so that's, that's actually, I mean, all these things are easy to say conceptually, right? It's like aspirationally. Operationally is a little bit different. And so let me, let me now switch to, to Elon's uh, comment. And this is going to sound like I'm evading the question and going off on a tangent. It's not really, I, I, as, as Perry Mason used to say, I will connect this up, Your Honor. Um, so before... Well, the reason I became aware of the evolutionary basis of the emerging disease problem was because of work I was doing at a conservation area in Costa Rica. And the work I was doing there was an exercise in socioeconomic development in rural areas of, of a Latin American country based on sustainable use of biodiversity resources. And it worked something like this. We would go into to villages. We would identify people who, regardless of how much or how little formal education they had, were people who knew a lot about their local diversity. Because it's a mistake to think that people who live in a rich tropical area and haven't, haven't been to university don't know anything about the biodiversity. Um, and we would find the people who were exceptionally good we would hire them to work in the conservation area. We would not send them off to university. We would just take advantage of the skills they already had in the area. They would work with the international specialists who came in. And 
they, of course, would talk to their neighbors about what was going on. Their neighbors would see, oh my God, you know, you're, you're making really good money doing this. And they would talk to the neighbors. One of the things that, that the, the firefighting brigade in that conservation area is made up completely of people who had been convicted of setting fires for poaching. And they were given the option of making more money putting fires out. And they immediately said, this is great. We didn't want to burn down our homes, but we needed to do that to make money to feed our kids. So it turns out that it's actually, if you're willing to, to invest in human beings, it's, it's actually doable. We, we, we know how to do this and we have done it. And it doesn't, you know, it doesn't require you know, turning everybody into some sort of, of PhD. It doesn't, it doesn't require taking people away from their homes and their families and so on. Um, and, and so that's part of the reason that, that I have uh, confidence that this bottom-up uh, approach can help, with, can, can work, if people put enough energy into it. And I know that that can connect really well with the specialists because that's what happened, I mean, the last time I had a grant renewal uh, based on the work I was doing in the conservation area, we were reporting 120 scientific publications in the previous six years. So you end up with this enormous amount of scientific production as a result of putting some educational effort into people who had sixth grade educations, who had a strong vested interest in the quality of life for their families in the local area. And so that, that can work. Now, to connect from that over to Jim, is that another thing about Costa Rica is that Costa Rica has the lowest birth rate in all of Latin America. And we did this exercise in the conservation area about 10 years ago. We made a big chart. There are 140 Costa Ricans working employees, mostly women, working in the conservation area. We just made a very simple chart. All their names, how many brothers and sisters do you have? How many children do you have? One generation of giving women economic opportunities, six, two, nine, two, eight, one, 11, zero. One generation, you give women educational opportunities, economic opportunities, they will regulate their, their reproduction. And what I want is not to impose anything on anybody. I want people, the maximum number of people around the world, to have the opportunity to decide for themselves. And in some cases, they're going to make poor choices, like the United States. The United States has, in fact, with respect to climate change, if 2050 is a reasonable inflection point, major global inflection point, the United States, because it's so big and its bureaucracy has so much inertia, the United States will not make it. NASA projects that between 2030 and 2050, drought in the middle section of the United States will cost the United States between 35 and 65 percent of its food production. If it's 35 percent of its food production, the United States disappears from the global marketplace. Because that's what the United States foreign trade is based on, is food. It also affects the countries that depend on that food, but the United States will continue to be an entity with people, but it will not exist on the global market. If it's more, if it's something like 50 to 60% of the food production, then the United States will be in the interesting position of asking for food support from all the many friends it's been making around the world for the last 30 years. Any question? Yeah, uh, you can all comment that uh, you would like to have uh, other more extensive others other people have questions but I, I just want to respond because I think you point, pointed to something really important and I uh, <laughs> I didn't mean that only in this case um, no I think your point is very well taken in terms of both the education and the way you engage with people I mean this is something you know 
many people have done, myself included, in terms of transdisciplinary, really engaging in populations. A book that we just finished will come out this week or next from Springer on uh, social transformations, which is done through a set of 40-some projects in which we did use local people as engaged in the science with the whole community, not the outside parachute in scientist. So I completely agree with that and, and very much support it and, and uh, thrilled to hear about it. My concern was a little bit different and that is the people in the educated communities all over the world who are nominally, again, well-educated. They've been, they're involved in commerce, they're in policy, you name it. But they don't get their vulnerability in this context. That's what I was concerned about. That's, that's super because this is, this is a critical element, and again, it, it addresses uh, some of Jim's concerns. It's a critical aspect of, of urbanization. I mean, it's, you know, the more you're trapped inside a city, the less likely you are to know anything about what's outside the city. So at the University of Toronto, for example, we had the first year biology classes, 2,500 students sitting in Convocation Hall. It's 2,500 students in one place. The last time I taught that course in 2009, we did a questionnaire at the beginning of the, of the course, get the students' background. 80% of those students have come to the University of Toronto to go to medical school. Okay. Right. Now, you know, almost all of them are wrong, but they don't know it yet. But the, the really critical the thing that showed up by 2009 was that less, fewer than half of those students had ever spent even one night outside of Toronto. Why would you want to go out? Everything you need is there in the city. You know, you want, you, why go out into messy nature when you can see a video of it? And this is this is this is non-trivial, and 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 this is this could in fact be a huge impediment for us, because this is a situation. This is sort of a, you know, sin of omission kind of thing, where these are not people who are antagonistic to the notion of climate change, but but you're right. They have no terms of reference about how to assess what they're hearing. They don't have any way to decide who to contribute money to, and they have no skills to contribute their time and effort to because they, because they don't know. And, that, and I, I think that's, a, that's an additional issue we have with this in, increasing urbanization. And I'm, I'm, quite, I'm quite worried about that. I mean, Jim, Jim knows that, you know, I'm, I'm quite worried about the, the possibility that the Melbourne Sustainable Studies Institute report from 2014 was correct, and that by 2050, 50% of the people on this planet are going to be gone. And we won't, we won't have any, any role in determining who goes and how much of the world's technological infrastructure goes with them. Because if 70% of the people are in cities, that's where all of our infrastructure is. You know, we, we have put ourselves in a severe corner. And, and as far as getting the human population down, okay, that's why I talk about buying time. I mean, you know, a, a hard landing is not a plan. That's, that's a failure, okay? It may happen. But you've got to, you've got to work towards a, a, a situation in which the current trends continue. I mean, the trends are for global fertility rates to drop. And the report that just came out two weeks ago says that they're dropping faster than people anticipated. 
And in my, my cynical brain, I'm saying that's because all the people who were doing the predictions were men and that the women around the world actually know more about the reason for reducing the number of children than we men think they do. Uh, yes, uh, I'm happy that uh, Professor Bogard is also raising his, uh, his hand because uh, migration is definitely a topic where we need also the other angle uh, from the water. Thank you very much. Uh, then you mentioned, and it was very appealing or, or frightening, that the world will be split into two sort of places. One place from where you are running away and the one where you are running to. As of today, it is quite evident where these two ends of the trajectory are on a global scale. But what you just mentioned about uh, the adaptability or, or the potential adaptation failure of the United States, uh, can you imagine that one of the sought after running to places might even become uh, runaway places. And I mean, I believe if you look back into US uh, history, uh, the uh, Great Dust Bowl, uh, when migration happened within the limits of a country, it was praised as adaptation and mobility, not migration. But when people went away from the Dust Bowl states, you could say by the distance they covered that this was simply migration. Yes, thank you. Um, I have a, uh, I, I think we're facing a, a disaster, but there are paradoxical aspects of it. So I uh, want to. Uh, ask you about uh, the dilemma I'm facing. Uh, that, for example, uh, in teaching energy, uh, we look at the uh, projections of uh, population and uh, essentially 2040 population projections go to uh, from 7.3 uh, now to about 9.2 or something like that. And uh, yesterday, Sean showed that 2050 is uh, even higher and so on and so forth. Now, without any further acceleration in uh, climate change, uh, at the present rate, we seem to be facing a uh, spreading aridity in uh, south of the Mediterranean, uh, creeping upwards, but certainly south of the Mediterranean, North Africa, and probably uh, Sub-Sahara as well. Now, this would mean uh, that people will be moving to more desirable places. Um, now, those more desirable places were uh, not able to absorb uh, with uh, political stability, about two million, uh, and not proportion of um, Africa. Now, to add to the confusion is that African population is projected to increase faster, as are uh, energy resources in Africa more and more being found which has nothing to do with aridity. I mean, if you don't have food, you'll move. Um, so whether you, there is energy there will not be... So essentially, uh, what I'm trying to uh, say, two things. One is that, would you care to give us a scenario like you did with the United States, a, a scenario for Africa to Europe. Um, and the other aspect of it is essentially a scenario like that. How many lives is that going to take um, 
because there isn't that much time for uh, voluntary or uh, uh, perceived need to reduce fertility. Well, okay, the, 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 the little ray of hope in that is that fertility rates actually are dropping, and they're dropping faster than we thought. The population is still increasing because infant mortality is dropping. So it's this, this part of this paradox. You know, health is improving. So, uh, and, and Costa Rica, for example, has had that problem. They finally got it under control, but 20 years ago, they had the lowest fertility rate, the lowest birth rate in Latin America, but they still had an expanding population because they also had this wonderful healthcare system and all the babies were surviving. Or, you know, a, a, the infant mortality was very, they had the lowest infant mortality rate and the lowest fertility rate in Latin America, but their population was still increasing. And longevity and da -da and all these, these sorts of things. Um, Some, some of you in the audience have heard me say this, and you've heard me say that I would never say this in public, but I think, I, th I think we have to say this in public. I think that these protocols that we're suggesting are, in effect, protocols for how the remaining 50% will survive after 2050. I think there's a real, ch I'm extraordinarily concerned that we're going to hit a major, you know, if it was a group of lizards, we would just call it a population correction. Um, I, I'm extremely worried about that. And I'm not, I, I don't know what to do about it. I mean, I'm, I'm, you know, I drop back into sometime in the next 20 years, some 18-year-old somewhere, you know, in Cape Town or Nairobi or Hokkaido or somewhere is going to have some kind of insight that's going to do something. But I don't, I can't imagine what it would be. I don't know. Um, the, the, the projections that I've always, always been working with on, on population growth was, were that we would asymptote at about 2,100. And, and after that, if we were able to survive past 2,100, that after that, the human population would begin to drop in absolute terms. So again, that's why I talk about buying time. Um, but that's, that's, as Sean says, that's aspirational. And, and my worry, and, and I'm hoping that it's, just because I'm an old man, uh, my worry is is that we're in we're in deep shit, and I mean that in the technical sense. Um, and so, I mean, what what you know what you guys are saying is is the, they're the same worries I have, but I come from a a cultural background and a generation and 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 a place. Washington, D.C. in the 1960s, where there was a, a, you were conditioned to believe that there was great virtue in fighting for a good cause no matter what the odds were. And you would just simply, it was better to go down fighting than to give up. And so I, constitutionally, I'm, I'm incapable of thinking of failure as a, as a plan. But I'm not delusional. And I'm, I'm really worried. I got the twin stimuli of Cape Town and Ordur, so <laughs> how could I resist? Uh, <laughs> uh, so let me ask a question and then make a couple of observations which are not intended to frame your answer to the question, but perhaps to elicit a response more broadly. So the question is, um, I guess where Jim was coming from, I will phrase in a slightly different way, but it's the same question. Is your intent normative? Are you seeking 
don't answer yet, but yeah, yeah, that, yeah. that's the question. Because what one intends should shape what one communicates. So if one's merely doing an analysis, then one does the analysis and one lets the chips fall where they may because that's what one's seeking to do. If one's seeking to cause behavioral change, then one adopts a different strategy, both in respect to what one communicates and you know, I guess in a way that Ilan was talking about this morning uh, in respect of the activities that one engages in around the messaging. Hmm? So just as a reflection. You mentioned two things that I know a little bit about, uh, Duke Energy on the one hand, because I knew Jim Rogers very well at the time when Jim was something of an outlier in respect of the energy world, to put it mildly. Um, and uh, Costa Rica for a whole variety of reasons, including Jose Maria Figueres and Cristiana and many others. But the specifics of Costa Rica really matter because if one has a normative intent, there are actually lessons to be learned from the Costa Rican experience. And I guess the first, I'm only going to touch on three, but the first element was that uh, uh, Jose Maria Figueres Ferrer uh, abolished the army in 1948. Now, when you abolish the army, uh, and at the same time you make quite sure that the eldest son of all of the Baronish go to West Point uh, or other military academies, then you are pretty safe in respect of ensuring that other people are not going to mess with your borders too much uh, because you've got protection from on high. Uh, and at the same time, you have a significant additional amount of money available to you to engage in serious social investment that can be transformative in a variety of ways. If you then keep on setting aspirational targets, and you know, apart from the family that I'm referencing, there was Oscar Arias and a number of other people in that particular space who obviously set fairly high standards in this regard, and you did get transformative effects. But to fit with your migrational frame, Costa Rica over the last decade or so has faced monumental problems as a result of, let's call it the hammer, out of both Mexico and Colombia, forcing inter alia drug smugglers and money launderers and God knows what else into the whole of that intermediate space, which has caused very significant security problems on multiple levels in respect of even that environment. So I guess the one part of it is you can do quite a lot to get stuff right, and on a small scale, um, you, can, you can do that. Baltic states under present circumstances, Singapore, maybe Hong Kong at different periods. You know, there's lots of ways to think about that sort of thing. The problem is that if you are, if you project significant increases in migration for all of the reasons that most of us expect that to happen, if you project significant uh, increases in mobility, business, tourism, uh, and many other factors in respect of that. If you anticipate uh, both the transition of uh, pathogens from animal species to human species and the rapid transmission of those pathogens, possibly associated with conditions of high mortality or not, but uh, as a result of both travel and migration, all of which potentially is exacerbated by external factors, climate among others, um, then you've actually got to start thinking about this challenge on, in global terms. You know, how, how, do you, how do you tackle it in global terms? How, how do you think about that? What would an appropriate response path start looking like now? What should the IOM be doing? What should, uh, should there be, a, at some point in time, a serious discussion of this in the uh, in the General Assembly and the Security Council even. What, uh, how does that fit with the SDGs? The SDGs involve significant investments in improving overall access to the goods that we take for granted in the advanced world, but which are not common uh, in less developed countries and certainly not in least developed countries. But these are targets for 2030. They have implications in the greater scheme of all of this. And I suppose, finally, how does one deal with 
current population projections, which, so that I don't have to go through the math that gets you to the point that I'm going to end at, are likely to result in 2.5 billion more people in cities by 2050, 90% of whom will be in Africa and Asia, uh, on the basis of present projected population movements. Now, in the scenarios that you're bringing to bear in this regard, these are all rather central elements. And if one does have any normative intent within the framework of this, we've got a hell of a lot of work to do. Yeah, well, I would say that the first thing we have to, to recognize is that, um, and that's why I said business as usual is not working. And that means every single organization of any kind on this planet, the record is that every single organization that we have set up, every bureaucracy that we've set up, non-governmental, international, local, blah, 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 they're not working. They're not working, okay? Now, in the case of, of health, uh, it, it would be wonderful if anybody in the public or agricultural health system would talk about proactive measures. But it's not profitable. Okay. Prevention is a lot cheaper than, than crisis response. Okay. Diet change, if I lost weight, I would be at a lot, less ri lot lower risk for having to cost somebody's healthcare system to do a coronary bypass operation on me. And we, we know that with respect to non-infectious disease dynamics with the other you know, non-infectious non disease health issues. We know that prevention's better than, than crisis response. But we're not doing that with, em with emerging diseases because it's not profitable. And I'll give you an example. Everybody who's, got, who's raising domestic pigs in Hungary lives in the countryside. And whatever piece of land they have they expand their fence line out to the edge of the land that they own so that they can have the maximum number of pigs on that land. That means that the fence is right up against the edge of the forest. Every spring, the veterinarian comes in and says, oh, your pigs have the following things. I will medicate them for these worms. I'll vaccinate them for this. He makes some money. And he's really happy because he knows that next spring he'll be back doing the same thing because the domestic pigs are getting reinfected by the real reservoir of the disease, which are the wild boar in the forest on the edge of the fence line. And the veterinarian knows that. But he's not going to cut into his repeat business. The pharmaceutical companies know about antibiotic resistance. They have learned antibiotic resistance basically is an indication that the pharmaceutical industry has learned how to make a profit from natural selection. What you do is you insert a chemical between the human immune system and the microbe. You force the microbe to adapt to the chemical. You do not allow the human immune system to even see the pathogen. So there's no net benefit from that. And as soon as the microbe adapts to that antibiotic, you pull it out and you put another one in and charge more money for it. It's wonderful. It's repeat business. It's good stuff. Same with vaccinations. The most productive 20-year period in human history for the production of vaccines was 1880 to 1900. We have been falling behind in terms of length of time to development and cost for vaccines ever since 1900. In 1913, the first effort was undertaken to develop a yellow fever vaccine. 1928, 15 years later, no progress. At that point, 
a man in Uganda who was infected with yellow fever had a blood sample taken that was plated out on a bunch of different culture dishes sent to labs around the world. Ten years after that, somebody recognized that one of the cultures had mutated in a way that just fortuitously allowed them to make a vaccine. Instant Nobel Prize, of course, blah, 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 a great success story. So that's 1938, that's 80 years ago. Fast forward 80 years, 100% of all yellow fever vaccines given on the planet today come from that one mutated strain. We have made zero progress. Polio is re-emerging. And here is how it re-emerges. We have two polio vaccines. I can still remember lining up with my schoolmates to eat those sugar cubes. My parents were so happy. I was too young to realize why they were so worried. Both of those polio vaccines, the Salk and the Sabin vaccines, are both weakened virus vaccines. You're being, you are ingesting viruses that are not dead. And the assumption is that your immune system will fire up antibodies and kill off those weakened viruses. But what if you're immunocompromised or immunosuppressed by malnutrition and other diseases when you're vaccinated? Then the virus reconstitutes itself in the environment. So when I was in 2017, when I was in Stellenbosch, there was an outbreak of, of polio in Congo. It wasn't in an area where people weren't being vaccinated. We've got, we've got severe, severe problems, and yet those are the people who are determining the agenda. They're the ones who are saying, you cannot do anything proactive with emerging diseases because we can't predict them. And if that were true, if I say malaria, everybody in this room instantly thinks mosquito. But I didn't tell you what part of the world, I didn't tell you which species of malaria. And yet, you're all correct because the ecology of all these malarias is so specific that we can anticipate an enormous amount of what's coming at us with respect to malaria and we can do something. But that's just basic natural history. It's not biotech, it's not expensive stuff, and it's not something that's going to maintain the profits of the corporations that drive the agenda. Or would you like? Okay. Then we have to work with them. Is that what you're saying? You know, like the Duke, whatever. Um, then there has to be a way of working with them to somehow show them another way where they can make money and still develop things and, and um, get over some of these shortcomings. I mean, because the last two days I've been hearing <laughs> only negative um, points, which um, it's not clear. Okay, we may say that we're not gonna be around, so that's fine, but our children, our grandchildren, their grandchildren, or our students are whatever, they're, they're going to be around. So um, we really, uh, and as far as I can see, the only way to work out these things is from grassroots. It's not going to be, because all I hear is that none of the policies, none of the things are going to work, because they are either planned for a short time or planned for profit immediately, whatever. So if we want to survive, it has to come from the bottom. So there we have to find ways of working together with people and, and developing these narratives or what, you, you know, and, and let's try to spread them as fast as possible <laughs> is the only thing I can think of, you know. But thank, thank you, Dan, Dan Lili. It cheered us up again, and uh, we would like to listen to you endlessly um, until, we, until our, uh, our appetite goes away, goes away forever. But um, 
with no 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 um, dinner then, just um, but but it's very important to warn us um, um, all of the dangers you 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 describe. But I think now is it probably time to turn to 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 towards solutions. So we are in the solution business as we agreed. But first, before I would ask a practical question, I want to give it back the mic to. I have a probably very naive idea, and I'll stick my neck out and try it anyway. Um, and it is only partially formulated, but it's built on something that one of my former students um, now is an economist at the um, National Institutes of Standards and Technology, and she leads a group um, looking at risk and uh, disaster recovery and business development. And what they've done is developed a tool, uh, I think the acronym is EDGE, but I don't remember what it stands for, um, to make an estimate of the resilience dividend. And I'm trying to think, how might we use that idea here? Because the idea is you've, just had a major flood in uh, Colorado. Okay, the next one is only gonna come in 100 years, right? Um, well, then we don't have to build anything. Well, okay, we'll spend some money, we'll build something, but what if it doesn't flood again? We've wasted the money. This is terrible. Well, no, if in fact, you, the, the discourse now shifts to the idea this is an investment in what they're calling the resilience dividend. But what I'm just noodling about, trying to blunder my way towards, is is there a way we could think about a health resilience dividend? Any country that has a national health care system, any reduction in costs is going to take a burden off of the people. Okay? So that, that's, that's the dividend. So, for example, that's why Canadians spend less in taxes for their health care system than, than Americans do in insurance premiums for the same quality health care. And I know that because I lived in Canada for 30 years. And, and Canadians spend much less for pharmaceuticals because the government went to the pharmaceutical companies and said, you know, we're going to buy generics unless you bring your pr prices down. And, and it worked. Can you do it Sure. But, but I'm in, the, in exactly the same way. The argument to every country that has a national health care system, prevention of any kind, is cheaper than crisis response. That's the argument. And it doesn't, you know, you don't have to have a guarantee that you're going to reduce everything. I mean, we're not going to stop all of this stuff. This is going to come through. There are going to be problems, dot, 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 dot. But to be forewarned is to be forearmed. You know, all these platitudes, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure, blah, 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 right? But it's true. I mean, they're all platitudes, but they're actually true. And ultimately, it becomes a question of cost savings. And it turns out, in addition to, in addition to prevention in general being cheaper than crisis response, mm -hmm. the more that prevention is based on public service, you know, in Kursig, for example, we have Hillary Brown and I have talked about the idea of a, uh, a pilot project for this, this DAMA protocol in Kursig in which the major reporting center would be inside the innovation center that her project envisions. I mean, it would piggyback perfectly. And here's, here's the photograph. Okay, in a, a town like Kursig, it's a small town, but like 
all modern towns, both parents have to work now to pay the bills. So who takes care of the children when they get out of school and before their parents are home? Turns out to be the same people who've lived in that village for 65 years and know everybody and everything. So here's the poster. It's a backlit photograph of grandpa with the grandchild and the grandfather's pointing at a tire with water in it and the grandchild has the cell phone out, taking a picture of it, and is going to report that in to the reporting station. The grandfather has no idea of how to do that, but the grandkid does. And the grandchild is being taught something about basic epidemiology. The grandparent and the grandkid are doing something together. I mean, and it's cheap. It's, it's a lot of sweat equity, what we, what we called sweat equity in, in the biodiversity arena, right? But it's the same thing. It's a lot of sitting around, and, and as I'm sure your, your, your analogous program was doing, the one thing you have to do is it's not going to work for me to walk into Kursik speaking no Hungarian, not being a Hungarian, and tell them what to do. That's, that's the best way to fail. And so one of my jobs in Hungary has been to identify charismatic Hungarian scientists, disease specialists, like Gabor Foldvari from the, the veterinary university here, and say, so not only is he Hungarian and a specialist, but he's originally from that area. And, and that's, you know, that's sort of the, the human the human capital expenditure that's, that's necessary, but it would work in Hungary because there's a national health care system where the tax burden is reduced as a result of reducing crisis response. Uh, yes. Thank you. Uh, two comments. Uh, when you talked about the pharmaceutical companies who call the shots and run the agenda. I was thinking, but did not want to come up with this idea alone, that why don't you tell them that if business is usually continued and one of your horror scenarios halfway comes through, so four billion people less, it means business is halved. Is this is not good news. In addition, some of the uh, leaders could be among the four billion. It's even worse news. Uh, but this is a little bit childish, but uh, maybe worse to try. Uh, the second thing is what you just said. It is uh, where we can uh, clean in our own doorsteps academia, because what you are telling again, it's not only uh, to educate well people, but to educate them to educate, to create a kind of, of agency or a kind of uh, professional moral in our students, uh, and of course a value system in academia, that those who go out and look for those sixth grade educated people who can, can do the next step of dissemination and to get some reward not only in a conference, not only from retired people who are not anymore able to promote them to a better position in their own career. So it's a kind of rethinking, a very profound rethinking in the science industry, if I may say so, uh, to reward those who would work and, and enable a, a bottom-up pressure to grow. Because uh, the situation is, uh, as you said, in the last two days, you heard only negative news. Where are the positive news? Okay, uh, if people are aware, if people are moving on it, if people, uh, if, if let's say some kind of movement is as powerful as some migratory streams, which uh, uh, helped people wake up to certain problems. This is what is somehow missing. Because uh, I believe uh, even if uh, the best tabloids of the world would run your news that by 2050 there would be one billion people in the world and you may not be among those, 
which would be a quite nice uh, headline for Bild Zeitung, or, or I, do, I do not know what uh, that typical American tabloid is. But uh, so this is, this is where I believe uh, it's, it's homemade message. We can do it, and we should do it, and, and walk to our, our uh, rectors or presidents and say that uh, this is what uh, uh, educational moral is yeah. and professional moral. Thanks. I, I asked about uh, whether you were seeking to be normative, Dan, or, uh, or prophetic. And, and you know, Cassandra sitting up there, of course, is, uh, in a certain sense, the psychological answer to that question. But l l let, me, let me just say two things about it. You know, Cassandra ended up where she ended up because uh, she, she reneged on a deal with Apollo which, generally speaking, is not a terribly good idea. If you've got a dominant god hanging around, and uh, the deal is you'll be able to see the future as long as you sleep with me, and then she gets to see the future and she reneges on the deal, then he curses her, and that's the sort of underlying thesis, nobody will ever believe you. So you don't want to be Cassandra, that's a really bad deal for anybody, and, and I think the sort of challenge is to how to get out of it. I, I'm not anything like as pessimistic as you are, although I understand exactly where you're coming from in respect of it. Have a look at HIV, and let's just roll back 25 years in respect of HIV. I had a president at that stage, who also happened to be a friend, who made the sort of gigantic mistake of coming to the conclusion that because six million people who were already HIV positive at that point in time we're inevitably going to die if HIV led inevitably to AIDS and it was impossible to do something to prevent AIDS causing death in a relatively short time frame, then something larger than the number of people who died of the Holocaust were already committed to death in respect of uh, the African environment. He made a hell of a lot of noise and also made a hell of a lot of mistakes, but that's neither here nor there. The point is today, the price of antiretrovirals following a number of court actions that were brought, has been brought down to about 15% of what they were at that time. Antiretrovirals, despite extraordinary inefficiencies in respect of African health systems, public health systems, have been rolled out on a gigantic scale. And the prognosis, if you're HIV positive today, uh, in respect of death from AIDS within eight to 10 years, which was a certainty, uh, 15 years ago, um, is now around about 15% in terms of WHO estimates in respect to these things. So that, that's an example of when you get enough energy behind an issue of what you can do about it. Uh, the problem is you can't do that step by step by step, so you've got to get an overall sense of the scale of the challenge in order to be able to deal with it. But I think we actually do have the resources, both financial and others, in order to be able to deal with this challenge, if we take it on. Um, and all I'd suggest is that, you know, you've got an incredible body of research, knowledge, insight, and perspective in respect to this. Don't fall into the trap of becoming Cassandra. <laughs> That's all I'd say. Thank you, Sean. I think we should move further a little bit. Um, or go deeper into the solution business um, instead of just threatening each other with a completely gloomy future. And I, I have a humble question. It's not very easy to ask. It's a simple question. If you, any of you, have any, anything in your mind whether uh, we could put together this huge amount of knowledge which was presented here today and yesterday and and tomorrow, we have another half day, um, in a way which can be um, helpful to, to change the discourse. 
is the narrative in Hungary, in university circles, academic circles, um, wherever, circles, networks of activists or civil society, um, circles. In other words, do you think that the moment is here to start to draft something? Instead of just repeating our conference, I really enjoy intellectually and also I think psychologically it's important to have meetings like this, um, very high level of expertise, people basically like each other and um, but, but I had this question before we started to organize. Are we going to do the same again, the third um, Blue Sky, European Blue Sky Conference? And more and more um, intelligent people are coming and, and painting a less and less rosy picture about the future. Uh, some students are here, most of them are left. By the time they have better things to do with the pubs in, in Budapest are more interesting probably than, than gloomy pictures. So, but I mean, I'm, talk, I'm trying to be self-reflective, I'm not critical about Dan or anyone, I'm just asking myself if we should jump out from this box, still an academic box, um, even if it's unusual, trans, inter, multidisciplinary, and um, think about how to change at least the narrative, the discourse. So we are talking to each other, we had one, one person representing the, the, the Hungarian authorities today, and we had another one, a young one yesterday, who was very interested, coming from the minister presidency, um, a, young, a young man who was actually lecturing himself about similar issues. Um, and he was very enthusiastically suggesting that all these lectures should be shown maybe to the parliament and maybe a little naively, but at least what I feel that there is a need um, more obvious for me than let's say two, three, five, ten years ago. There, is, there are still deaf authorities, ministers and ministries and global and international organizations falling apart or becoming, unfortunately, Trump's face was not so bad about UN, a coffee clutch, more or less ineffective, suggesting things which states are, are refusing, yeah? not having dialogue. So again, make it short. Do you think that are any ways we could start a different dialogue, a different discourse? And if yes, then what? Because just publishing a report or, or what we were talking about with Janos and some others, um, a manifesto, it, it, it's a good idea, but there were a lot of similar things, maybe tens of thousands of similar um, scripts will follow. Um, so can we bit become a little contemplative and reflective on this? Maybe today uh, over dinner or tomorrow after the, the last talks? Or if you have an, any anything uh, immediate suggestions, I would be very much uh, personally interested. So what, what, what do we do? We, we start to organize the force, Blue Sky? No, I just wanted to bring into the discourse uh, uh, the notion of care. Uh, because I think we've been, you know, a little bit um, going around and around it, but we never really addressed it head on. And it always comes up with the notion of women and, you know, women do this, women, women can get active and women, um, uh, when they realize that there's economic opportunities or, or uh, 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 any kind of possibilities, then the birth rates uh, uh, go, go down and we always talk about us in in that regard and I'm wondering if we kind of change the perspectives uh, and the discourse to a more feminine discourse talking about care instead of state security talking about uh, not just mother nature but but also institutional systems in a way in which we are talking about actual people and we are talking about uh, uh, 
upcoming generations. Tomorrow we will have a, a talk on children and children in migration situations. And I think that that will be a nice um, kind of moving towards talking about the, the upcoming generations and, and what to do with this. And uh, I just wanted to already bring this notion of care into our heads. Can I just respond in the same vein? Because I think that uh, Ferenc has asked a very important question. And I think that Dan has got a phenomenally important resource. I mean, the, you know, where did we start? We started uh, with Thomas asking a question, how can science influence policy? How can science be brought to the attention of policymakers in ways that bring about better policies, right? This is a really good question. Most of us have spent quite a lot of our lives trying to grapple with that particular question at different times. And some of us have been successful occasionally, and all of us, I'm sure, have failed occasionally as well. But, you know, I, I, I think the exciting thing about this is that you have got, in terms of this forthcoming book, which we really hope is going to get published sometime this year, um, but you, you've got, and well, maybe next year, but uh, in, in within 12 months, the, you've got an extraordinary resource because you've collected a phenomenal amount of material which highlights the issue in very profound ways. The consequences in the event of business as usual are fairly horrific. Um, and under those particular circumstances, it behooves us, in the most fundamental sense, to find ways of turning that in order to influence policy outcomes. If we don't succeed in doing that, we're all bloody useless, to be perfectly honest. There's nothing extraordinary about that. So, so that's, that's all I was saying about don't be Cassandra in respect to this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Have an impact, you know, get, get the outcome. Now, let me offer just three things very quickly. I've, I've told you the HIV story, and the HIV story is within uh, broad parameters, an accurate summary of the current situation. But what I haven't said is how part of it happened. And one part of it happened because Bill Gates, at a particular point in time, and for Bella's, uh, to Bella's point, under Melinda's pressure, he wasn't doing that because it struck him as a brilliant idea, came up with the construct that it was necessary to develop a means of sharply reducing the cost of pharmaceutical products for large-scale delivery in respect of what were called at that moment diseases of poverty. Right. All right? So it was malaria, HIV, uh, TB. That was the sort of spectrum, and out of that grew the Global Fund, triggered inter alia by discussions that he drove at Davos. And then subsequently, you actually got a, I published it years ago, but you actually got a value chain that preserved money for the pharmaceutical companies by allowing mass purchasing by international organizations thereby sharply reducing the margin per unit sold necessary to maintain the profitability of the pharmaceutical company, and that enabled the pricing, the predatory pricing, to be perfectly honest, of a number of pharmaceutical products in those areas to be undertaken. So there are ways in which this has been done in the past. There are ways to address these challenges in the future. You need to sharpen the focus, and then you need to develop solutions that enable this. Large-scale purchasing at guaranteed volumes is a mechanism for the reduction of pricing. It's done every day of the week in every country of the world in respect of anything that's purchased in bulk. So if one has a reasonable construct of what we need to be investing in, because right now that, I think, is lacking in the minds of most policymakers in this regard, if you have a reasonable construct of what we need to be investing in, I don't think it's beyond the wit of this group with a little bit of help from friends uh, to be able to develop business models that make it perfectly viable to be able to address a large chunk of this. One last observation. I think we all, I have been, some of you know it, this week in Washington, New York, London, Vienna, back to London, and now in Budapest. That's disgusting. It's truly disgusting. It's completely stupid. It's not good for my health. 
And quite frankly, if I applied my mind to the question of how much of what I've done in this week was vital, as opposed to just something that I had on my calendar, hmm, I don't think I'd have traveled a half as much, probably a third. So one of the things, one of the vectors for the transmission in this regard is the ridiculous amount that everybody is traveling all the time. I mean, it, it, whoever it was, was it you? I can't remember, Elon. Somebody said, the only vector is not migration. There are tons of other vectors in this regard as well, and travel is a fundamental one. The idea that because more Jap Chinese are now have passports, we're going to see a 10x multiplication within 12 years of the number of persons traveling around the world is an horrendous thought. Right? It, it doesn't make any sense at all. We, we, we've got to start rethinking the way we live in respect to these issues. So that's the second dimension of it, and there are probably 10 others. Oh, I wasn't expecting it so fast. <laughs> well, you mentioned that yesterday I said, uh, how do we bring science to the politicians? Um, but I also said, how do we bring it to the economic le leaders? How do we bring it to the media? And one important point for me is, how do we bring it to the voters? And, the peop and for the econo economy, it is, how do we bring it to the people who buy products? I gave the example of Ursula Brunner. Mm -hmm. She first went to the politicians yeah. with her. They didn't want to listen. Then she went to Migro, and Migro said, well, we are not a welfare sh shop. Then she went to the people on the street mm -hmm. doing all kinds of, let's say, <coughs> activities until more and more people started to buy their bananas in third world shops. And then Migro became interested because they saw, well, we can make profit here if we jump on this, I don't know what you say, bandwagon. Yeah. <coughs> and I think it is very important not only to talk to political leaders, I think we have to b convince the people in the street. I know we're running out of time, but I need, I need to, I need to to follow up on that, that's it's a really that's a really good point because, um, for example, one of the things that the, the best the best funded uh, DNA sequencing and RNA sequencing laboratories in the world, highest volume, best analysis and everything are in the pharmaceutical companies, the pharmaceutical industry, and. Um, one of the things that we've been, a project that's been underway for uh, 25 years now is handheld sequencing devices. And that's, that's something, you know, if you sit down with the pharmaceutical companies and say, start selling portable DNA kits as part of, then you can make money on, on anticipation, you can make money on prevention as well as on uh, the, 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 the treatment side. So there, there, there are a lot of ways to do this. I mean, at some point, if we're going to be doing, a, if we were actually going to be serious about looking for pathogens, what we call finding them before they find us, we're going to need a, a large supply of cheap sequencing stuff. It's not just going to be the, the grandparents and the grandkids, but then there's gonna be a next level that's also going to need you know, massive amounts of cheap but, but high-tech high products. I mean, some, it's basically the sequencing analog of this. You know, and what, what do you have if you have the ability to determine you know, what species you're dealing with and you've got a communications device and a, a photography device and, and, and all that in one handheld unit? Anybody ever watch Star Trek? It's called a tricorder. And there is this, this area of rapid DNA analysis called DNA barcoding. And there are prototype barcoders out there floating around already. 
So there, there, are, there are, like you said, there are lots of ways that you can actually uh, maintain a profit margin and change the orientation of, of the, uh, change the business model in a sense. Um, the comment or the, the thought that, that I'm struggling with at the moment, because I've, I hear quite a few rather different threads here, and they're, we're kind of talking past each other to some degree is the sense I have, all of which is interesting, any one of those threads. But if I'm going to think seriously about what you're asking about, okay, so what the hell do we do with this? The first thing that comes to my mind, and just as a, a thought, because I think what Thomas said in terms of the different populations one actually should be reaching, if these stories are to start having an impact. I mean, we have these ideas, these threads. How do we make an impact? And one maybe totally crazy idea is, why not a festival? and put it on the street, do it very specifically. I've been involved in a number of these, and some more successful, some not. I'll bet ma many of us have done that. But the thought would be that to take some very specific examples, you have these wonderful examples, Dan, and many others. I, I mean, I, you gave the example with the HIV. I mean, we had many already in the last day and half or two days. We can come up with many more, but then to translate those into events, into things that engage people on the street, in, and you bring in politicians, you bring in business, you set out panels that basically challenge these ideas in very practical terms, and perhaps be rather provocative. Exactly. Exactly. And Absolutely. Exactly. And, and the, the reason for the, I mean, you could just do another workshop here, but this is very limited. It's wonderful. It's a good, it's the catalyst and the starting point, but where do we go and make that then happen somewhere? And I think if it's that kind of environment, I mean, thinking about New York uh, Festival of Science, Cheltenham, the Exploratorium, uh, New, um, North Carolina F Museum of Science and Life. I, I mean, there's, I can give you a long list, but the point is that those really bring a lot of people together and can get funding for it. And then the issues, if we were careful about it, the point is to collect that response and the people and use that then as the leverage to move these ideas forward. I definitely think we have to uh, finish at a positive note, and that is, uh, was more uh, a, a very positive initiative. But I think uh, you raised a very interesting uh, topic, but it is something which has to be discussed over the dinner. Etudes on, on Europe. When we try to combine music and, uh, it's not a festival, but music and poetry um, with some kind of academic discourse, but, but open to everyone. And that is small, very small. New York is, is a little bigger than Manhattan and Kursk. But we do have a Kursk Manhattan project, and with that, we entertain, we started to entertain the Hungarian government. They fell in love with the circular economy. And this, these are small things that, that I would like to translate what we are doing, you know, into, into the language or the perception capacity of those who are not 
repre not presented here, not represented in this room. And that can be done in small and big, but so this is, I would love to urge you to, yes. to continue the discussion about it. Thank you very much, and I think that was one uh, important uh, uh, sentence what Dan told, uh, to be afraid but not to fear. And that is definitely what we have to uh, uh, transmit to our children, because uh, all kinds of fears are spreading around very fast. Thank you for your... Thank you. <laughs>